We're about 1,000 kilometers north of the Chicxulub impact site in a region that in the late Cretaceous was a shallow marine platform under several hundred meters of seawater and was bounded to the west by the active volcanoes of the Sierra Madre. We join Ian Gilmore searching out some more evidence for what happened at the KT boundary. Sixty-five million years ago, items sat in the ocean bottom. What I wouldn't have expected to find on the sea floor are these massive sandstones that you can see behind me. Clues as to what they're doing here come from this layer of orange rocks that we can see underneath them and some interesting fossils. A closer look shows the sandstone contains some large granules. Even closer, notice how well-rounded these granules are, a few millimetres in diameter. They turn out to be identical with those found in Haiti, glass ferrules produced by the melting of the target rocks on impact and forming part of the ejector from that impact. On the underside of some of the sandstone layers, there's a curious honeycomb pattern. It's very reminiscent of the box work from incinerated and so carbonized wood. Like this. More evidence occurs within the sandstone itself. These dark fragments are burnt pieces of wood. But how did they all get mixed up into the sandstone deposits? In places, the sandstone is almost five meters thick. What's interesting about it is that it doesn't contain any signs of animal life, such as worm burrows. This tells us that these sandstones must have been laid down so quickly that life didn't have a chance to recolonize the sea floor. However, at the top of the sandstone is an even more important clue to their origin. The top layer of the sandstone contains iridium fallout from the vaporized asteroid. Whereas the impact melt ejector, the material derived from earth rocks, is found in the glassy spheral layer, several meters below. Where did all the intervening sand come from? And how did it get here so quickly between the two layers produced by fallout from the impact? Perhaps the most fascinating theory to emerge is that the sandstones are evidence for giant tsunami or tidal waves and were deposited in the short period of time between the arrival of the initial ejector layer containing the spherules and the fallout of the iridium containing layer from the impact's fireball. The whole region was covered by a shallow sea. One would expect uh, massive tsunamis to be produced by the impact event itself, uh, and also tsunamis and earthquakes to pr be produced by the collapse of the crater. So the Gulf of Mexico must have been a very deadly place to be 65 million years ago. Another thousand kilometers away from the point of impact, takes us to the state of New Mexico in America. Rob Hoff, a research student at the Open University, joins Bruce Bohor of the US Geological Survey. Well, that's the boundary. So this is the boundary, yeah, right grayish white streak is the ejector layer and it has a nice black coal above it so it stands out well here. Okay. It's got quite dark gray clay below as well, yeah. Because this event was so large, it's a, a different type of cratering than uh, we have had experience with uh, on Earth, at least as far as the ejecta layers are concerned. We don't have well-preserved ejecta from any other impact at this distance from the actual crater. For much of the Cretaceous, central North America had been covered by sea. But by the time of the impact, this had receded, leaving behind broad, flat plains with streams meandering through them. Just the environment to preserve thin layers of sediment at the KT boundary. As we can see at the Raton Pass in New Mexico. So this white layer, layer here, Bruce, this is the uh, this is the ejector layer, is it? 
Yes, it's a white weathering clay stone. The second layer, the uh, fireball layer, is directly on top of that. It, it looks yellowish here, overlain by a, a thin uh, coal seam, which is the common occurrence uh, here in the Raton Basin and other places in the western interior. Uh, when we talk about the KT boundary here, we have two layers. They're both from the same impact. The lower one consists of melted target rock, siliceous target rock that's been splashed out and uh, deposited from an ejector curtain in the atmosphere. So it's restricted in its distribution around the impact crater to about a 4,000 kilometer uh, radius of Yucatan where we think the uh, impact occurred. However, the second layer that overlies it is called a fireball layer, and we find both of those layers, the thicker uh, ejector layer and the fireball layer, occur here in western interior sites, but at so-called far field sites, ones over in Europe or uh, in Asia and so forth. These uh, two layers do not exist, and instead there's just a single layer. It consists of the fireball layer. That's the layer that went all the way around the Earth. Let's take a look at it piece of the melt ejector layer that we collected yesterday. So what is thought to be the sequence of events at the KT boundary? Seems like this was a very large object, an asteroid, at least five miles in diameter, which is approximately the size of Manhattan Island, and, and maybe somewhat larger. This caused uh, uh, an enormous uh, shock wave, which and went down and started excavating rocks uh, from very deep below the impactor. It also caused the asteroid, the impactor, to vaporize because of its size and the speed of its impact and uh, the shock that occurred as it hit the Earth. This vapor cloud rose up and penetrated through the atmosphere and began to disperse and circle the Earth above the atmosphere. Meanwhile, the crater itself was forming and ejecting melted target rocks. These were spread out and formed the uh, melt ejector layer. But the upper layer, the fireball layer, spread around the globe. And that is why we do find a layer representing the KT boundary at all points around the globe. But there's a geological twist to the reason why the KT event was so catastrophic. After 100 meters of seawater, the asteroid hit sediments, limestones and sulfur-containing rocks called anhydrites. The spherules studied by Harold S. Sigurdsson are evidence of that. He found that they contain a relatively high sulfur content, up to 1% in weight. It is the unusual geochemistry or unusual sediments at the impact site that determine the severity of this impact. And in a way, you might say that the impact uh, hit the powder keg in creating the largest natural disaster that was conceivable. And we have estimated that as much as 10 to the 19 grams of sulfuric acid aerosol would have been emitted. And that is five orders of magnitude greater, for example, than the sulfur emitted by Tambora in 1815, which is the largest volcanic emission of sulfur that we know of. So five orders of magnitude, that is 100,000 times the mass that came out of Tambora. Sigurdsson believes that the sulfur would have produced a long-lived sulfuric acid aerosol, resulting in the backscattering of solar radiation for several years after the impact, causing a global cooling of the Earth. Preliminary models indicate that the cooling could have reached near freezing globally uh, within a month and uh, that uh, surface temperatures would have re remained very low for, for uh, several years. 